So be before I finish up talking about how ramps work, uh, about, about the first problem set, I, I'm getting two completely different kinds of questions, m many of each. Uh, w one of them is about the content of the, of the questions, I issues with the physics of the questions, which is, which is great. These are the questions that I, that I, that I like to hear. So you know, come and talk to me about the problem set questions if they're the, the point of the whole, the whole exercise is to, is to deal with those questions and figure out why the right answers are right, the wrong answers are wrong. The other type of question I'm getting, or inquiry, is about flaws in the software. Um, and I'm re reporting bugs as I see them, or as you see them. One of them is, and several of you hit this one, you can evidently submit a multiple choice question with no answer. And naturally, you get it wrong and you can't do it again. And I've, anyway, I've submitted that as a, what I consider to be a really serious bug in the software. Some engineer somewhere thought it was fine to accept that. But, you know, I, I, my analogy is this thing like, like if Amazon allowed you to place an order without an address and just simply didn't ship anything, um, you wouldn't shop there very often. <sighs> right, so I'm sorry about the bugs. Um, Please contact the tech support people and hassle them. This shouldn't happen. Any questions sort of generally about the problem set? Uh, Orion's another issue. Keep, you know, keep, keep work on the Orions. The details of the scores are not going to matter. I will work it out so if you keep picking them off and do, and do decently, overall, you'll get full credit for it. I know there, it's, there are ways in which you can seem, seemingly miss a little credit on, on one chapter. I, I'll, I'll look into this. Anything, anything, anything? All right. Um, so so where, where I left off last time in talking about ramps, I mean, really, where I'm headed with ramps is, is you can do this remarkable thing. You can lift very heavy objects using a ramp. It's one of the famous simple machines, also known as an inclined plane. You can lift very heavy objects, but you don't get something for nothing. There's a trade-off in using a ramp, yes? You can get something up to your second floor balcony um, that you couldn't otherwise lift up a ladder. But you have to travel a long distance while pushing on the object. There, so it turns out, and we're about, we're about to see it, that getting, it's a piano in the book, so it'll be a piano in my story. Getting a piano from the sidewalk to your second floor balcony, that lift, that rise in height, it's going to take you the same amount of work which is to say the same amount of energy transfer, whether you go up the ladder or whether you go up the ramp. The difference is going to be in the relationship between force and distance. If you go up the ladder, you're going to be exerting a huge upward force on the piano. And it'll travel a short distance up this little ladder, but during that time, you're going to be suffering. On the other hand, if you go up a ramp, you can get it up to the, the piano, up to the second floor balcony with a relatively modest force. But it's a very long ramp, so you're pushing for a long distance. So it's going to turn out force times distance. The force you exert on the piano times the distance the piano moves in the, in the direction of that force. That product of two things, force times distance, is going to be the same, whether you go up the ramp or up the ladder, or up a different ramp, or up a, you know, it's all going to work out. It all comes up the same amount of work. Okay, so that's. That's my plan to convey to you, and, and really to make sure that you, you, you see how that works. I'll remind you about energy and work. Energy is this conserved quantity, one of the, one of the precious few in nature. It's, you can't make it, you can't destroy it. The amount we've got in a confined environment like this, this room, it's, it's fixed. Uh, unless somebody brings some in or somebody sends some out, which is happening, and you know, the details are, are, if you look in detail, yes, some energy's coming in, coming going out. But Apart from the transfers in and out, it's, it's a fixed amount. You can move them around among yourselves, but you can't make it or destroy it. And again, the, the way of passing it from one person to another or one object to another mechanically is by doing work. You, you exert a force on something as it moves a distance in the direction of that force. So I'm pushing up on the ball as it moves upward. That's, that's work. And the amount of work is, is specific. It's, it's the amount of my force which in this case is, I don't know, a couple of newtons of upward force. And the distance the ball traveled, which is now about one meter. 
So I just did about maybe three Newton meters of work. Three Newtons of force times one meter of distance in the direction of that force. That's three Newton meters. Actually, the Newton meter is the, it, that is the metric or, or, or SI unit of, of, of work or, and of energy, the Newton meter. But it's so important that it's given its own name. Uh, it's just given the name the joule, uh, spelled J-O-U-L-E, after the physicist joule, not the thing you wear on your ring finger. OK? So I, I, here's me transferring about three joules of energy to the ball. And here's me taking away about three joules of energy from the ball. And the transfer is perfect. It, it's a, it, it, we can look at the transfer from the perspective not just of me doing work on the ball. So, so I'm pushing up on it, right? And it's moving distance in the direction of my force. It happens to be about this three newtons overall of work. But let's look at that from the perspective of the ball. Go start the story over. The ball is pushing on me in the downward direction. And my hand moves in the upward direction. So from the ball's perspective, as it's teaching its, its lesson to its fellow basketballs, it says, well, I'm pushing down on him, and he's moving up. I'm doing negative work on him. Right? So, so it did three joules of negative work on me as I did three joules of positive work on it. That's the whole transaction. My energy went down by, by being given negative amount of energy. The ball's energy went up by be, being given a positive amount of energy. The same amount. So I lost three joules, it gained three joules. It's, it's, a, it's a full transaction. Questions or, or, or concerns? Or? Right, so, so this is me giving three joules to the ball and it taking three joules away from me. And this now is me doing three joules of negative work on it, which is to say taking three joules away from the ball and it giving me back three joules. Right? It does positive work on me on the way down. And what do I do with that energy? Well, I turn it, actually, I, I, we're not good at, at storing energy. We, we waste it as thermal. Yeah? Ah, am, am, I, am I using a force to, to, to lower it here? Actually, I am exerting a force on it as it comes down. Right? My force on it is upward, but its movement is downward, opposite the direction of my force. So the, the amount of work I do on it, according to the rule, which is, is work is, the, is force times the distance it travels in the direction of your force, it's the wrong direction. So I'm doing a negative amount on it. So I'm taking energy out of it. And you can see that just on a grand scheme of things, this ball can do stuff. You know, it, it, it's got a long way to fall. It does interesting things. Whereas if I lower it all the way down to the floor, it's boring. It's, it, it's lost that energy. It's unable to do what it used to be able to do. So I have truly reduced its energy. Is that, that, is that OK so far? The other thing is, is that where did the energy go? It, does, it cannot be destroyed. It has to be conveyed to something else, me. So I'm getting it. As I lower this down, it truly gave me energy that it used to have when it was up here. And what I do with energy is I squander it. I, I turn it into, into thermal energy, which thermal energy is, and I'll, I'll do a, some story about this in the, in the context of friction and wheels. Thermal energy is, is the same as ordinary energy, except that it's chopped up into little pieces so that it's essentially uh, every atom and molecule and little piece that can move moving with its own portion of thermal energy. And because it's all fragmented into lots of little pieces, it's not able to do um, orderly things the way when this, when this entire object as a whole has this energy I just gave it, it's, it's, it's organized. The energy is in an ordered form. It is able to do things quite easily. If I let go of it, it immediately gets moving faster. Other, other moments, there is energy in motion. If, if, I, if you rub it like this, this, this involves work, or just take your hands, you, know, you do this, there's lots of work going on here. I'm pushing, one hand's pushing against the other hand, there's distance travel. It's a little complicated because of um, issues with friction, which we'll get to. But you can feel your hands getting hot if you do this. What's the hot? That is thermal energy. 
That is the microscopic motion of all the atoms and molecules and stuff that are in the surface in your hand or in your hand in general. They're all moving, uh, but they're moving with ran a random character to them. It's, it's, it's a statistical character, really, more, more than purely random. And that random motion of stuff is, is far less able to do interesting things like uh, throw a ball across the room than, it, than, than other kinds of energy, ordered kinds of, kinds of energy. So, when you, when you lift the ball up and give it energy, that energy came out of an ordered form in you. It came out of food calories. It, it was, you consumed it at one point. And actually, you can trace this back, way back, you can go all the way back to the sun. The energy almost surely originated in the sun at some point. Uh, it, it, crops grew based on sunlight. You ate the crops. You're consuming the... Crops grew, they accumulated energy given to them by the sun. The energy is now in the crops. You consume the crops, the energy is now in you. You use the, the, that energy to, in various ways, physiologically, to do this mechanical work on the ball. That was sunlight. It just worked its way through a whole series of transformations and objects. And now, when you take it back, you can't recreate the food. Uh, your body is unable to do this. Um, we're not like systems that can sort of wind up as you come down, like a pendulum, like a, like a pendulum clock. The, dis the descent of a weight often will run the clock for a while. Like you go to Monticello and watch the clock. It's powered by descending weight. So this ball coming down could, could power a clock. Instead, it, it, it goes into me, and I don't do anything useful, so I just turn it into thermal sort of energy to get hotter. So if you're lifting and lowering weights, this is part of the problem set. Uh, up and down, energy in the weights, energy back into you, you get hotter. Energy into the weights, energy back into you, get hotter. You're basically just turning your own food energy into thermal energy in you, which is why, in part why you get all sweaty. Um, and the weights are just an intermediary. Get the energy, give it back. Get the energy, give it back. Okay? Any questions? There are very few equations that I want you to know beyond yeah, just sort of seeing them and having some sense of them. The only two actually I can think of are Newton's second law, remember that one? The an object's acceleration is equal to the force you exert on it, or, or the net force overall, divided by its mass. That, that's, a, that's a relationship that's a quantitatively accurate in our universe and it is worth knowing as a sort of a true relationship, an equation. This one's also useful. So I, I would. Yeah, know this one. That the work you do on something is the force you exert on it times the distance it travels in the direction of your force. That's worth it. The other equations, and they'll get thin, they'll get very few. This particular this semester, I have no useful equations to give you over. Uh, Then look at the whole idea of watching energy move around. The reason energy is so useful is because it is a conserved quantity. And therefore, you can watch it move through systems. And the, the watching is often tells gives you a lot of insight into how the system works. So um, the energy in this case is moving from if you're pushing something up, if you're pushing a piano somehow or other up to the balcony, the second floor balcony. The energy is coming to you, going into the piano, and watching it do the movement will tell us a lot about things like the force you're exerting and uh, the distance you travel. Before I go into detail on that, which is the, the, the next and I think really the last in the few graphs for this story, a few things about energy. Energy has no direction to it, and that's worth remembering only, well, it's worth remembering because we're going to see two other important conserved quantities a little down the line, namely momentum and angularity, that do have direction to it. Momentum to the right is different from momentum to the left, so it hangs into the direction that matters. Energy has no direction to it. It's just an amount. This doesn't make it trivial. I think, you know, it's quite important, but it's, but it's, but it's just, you've got 75 joules of energy that's just there. Um, in that respect, it's very much like, like money. You've got $30. No, it's not 
thirty dollars to the right. Just thirty dollars. Uh, the free estate is not like a political donation. All right. I won't go there. Uh, what else? Okay. But energy can take different forms, in, including ones that are sort of hidden. Uh, that will not be true of, it, of momentum and, and any other energy. They're, they're much more in your face. So, so energy takes two principal style, there's two types, there's general types. One of them is the energy in motion itself. So a moving object, a basketball, motionless, doesn't have any of this stuff. They're both, uh, both uh, basketball. It's moving, it has, Back here. Has, has energy in its motion itself. The direction of the motion doesn't matter, which is, again, an observation that direction is an important energy. but but the speed matters. And that energy is called kinetic energy. It's just the energy of a moving object. So anything that's moving is carrying with it kinetic energy. It may have other forms of energy, but surely it has kinetic. And you can, you can calculate how much, but we'll get, you know, we'll get there a little, but barely. And the other kind of energy is the energy stored in forces. Uh, and those kinds of energies are known as potential energies. So whenever there are two forces, between objects. Yeah, clearly, objects, forces always come in pairs. So, so, for example, when the ball and the table are pushing hard against one another, as they are right now, I'm helping, of course. But I, 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 can, have it, I can be out of the picture like that. During the, during the peak of that impact, when those two balls, when the ball and the table are just dented hard into each other and are pushing ferociously on each other, there's energy stored in that, in that denting, in the, in the forces involved in those surfaces. And that, those are called potential energies. And in the case of the, the current story, the, the, the ramp story, and the get the piano to the, to the second floor story, the, the, more rel the most relevant force for storing energy is the force of gravity. Right now, there, is a for there are gravitational forces between the basketball and the Earth. They're pulling on each other. I, I, you certainly are aware of the Earth pulling on the basketball. I, I told you the other day that the basketball also pulls on the earth. It's there. It's a little harder to notice, but it's there. And the fact is, when I pull these two apart, which is what I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm pulling the, the basketball away from the earth, like stretching a rubber band. I'm packing that pair full of energy. It's now in a potential form. It's stored in the force of gravity, and it's called gravitational potential energy. Um, some, some, in some other contexts, they just leave out the word gravitational, although I think that's a mistake because there are other in interesting potential energies. So this is a gravitational potential energy. It's got more now than it does now. So that's where that energy is going. When I'm, when I'm lifting the ball, I'm lifting, going from here to there, and I, added a, I, I claimed about three joules of energy. It's three joules of gravitational potential energy that the ball has now that it doesn't have now. All right. Uh, there is this, just, just to, to go after what I would consider a little bit of an elephant in the room. I claim that the force is between these two objects, the earth and the ball, and it's stored in the forces between both of them. Why am I sort of assigning all the energy to the ball and saying it's energy, the ball's energy increased? Isn't it the pair? that it had an increase in energy? And the answer is, yeah, really, it's the pair now has more energy than before. But the Earth just so, moves so little in any of these stories that there's almost no work done on it or by it. So in lifting and lowering the ball, all the action is taking place around the ball. So when I lift the ball and add energy to the Earth and the ball in the form of gravitational potential energy, you're never going to see that energy have any interesting effect on the Earth. It's not going to move for, any, for all practical purposes, no movement. So all of the interesting energy storage and release, you know, putting energy in, taking out, all the action is, in, is on the ball itself. So we can say the ball has gravitational potential energy that it didn't have now. Can you see the, 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 the problem and why giving all the energy to the ball is, is OK? And these are sort of these are issues that get swept under the rug in, in so many courses. It's, it's kind of, yeah, I could just sweep them under the rug. But I'll tell you about them, and then we'll, then we'll sweep them under the rug. OK? 
All right. So in, in raising a piano, or let's say just this wagon, I'll put, and I'll put the, the square kid in it. Let's, and I'll make a ramp out of this. To lift that wagon to this height, which is about one foot off the ground, I can, I've got sort of two choices. One is I can go straight up uh, to like, like that. And there's the force I exert and the distance I, I, over which I exert it. Is a, it's a little complicated because I get, I, there's, a, there's a moment when I get the, the, the system accelerating to get, get it moving and then I go at constant velocity and then I accelerate downward to bring it to a stop. If we just leave out the details of starting and stopping, and just imagine that somehow I managed to get it to move it at constant velocity from here to here, the force that I do on the wagon and its contents is a big force upward exerted over a small distance upward, one foot. And as I recall from the green scale, this was, was 60 newtons, I think. And that distance is about three tenths of a meter, so 60 newtons of three tenths is about 18 joules, Newton, 18 newton meters. That's about 18 joules like this. And I did it by way of a big force, about 60 newtons for a short distance, about three tenths of a meter. If I go to the same height, the same altitude, but not straight up, but along the ramp, let me hope that this is the, I'm gonna, this is a spring scale. It tells you how, how, how much force it's exerting on the little hook at the bottom. 10 newtons, 20 newtons. If I try to lift this weight with, with this scale, it's, it goes to saturation. It can't, it can't handle it. It's too heavy. Let go, let go. Uh, even the other scale can't handle it. But let me go up the ramp with this guy. All right. I can go up the ramp at constant velocity now with about 12, maybe 13 newtons of force. You can see that? If starting, starting, I have to pull a little harder. Stopping, I pull a little weaker. But it's about 13 newtons to, to coast up that ramp at constant velocity. So I can. I can lift the, the, the wagon and its contents with a much smaller force. Yay! But there's a trade-off. I have to exert that force for a much greater distance. So the work that I do in going from down here, and actually I have to go a little farther, but I won't because I'll, I'll go off the ramp. I have to pull up with my little 13 Newton force for, oh my gosh, a meter and uh, maybe two or three tenths. So it's a smaller force, and it's a longer distance. And if you multiply the two, it's still going to come out about, what did I say before, 18 joules? I think was what I pulled out of it. It's the same work. Whether you go with a big force straight up the, the, straight up the ladder, big force, little distance, or small force, long distance. And you, if, if you adjust the ramp, if I make the ramp steeper, I'll get to the height that I wanted. It'll occur about here, shorter distance, but the force will get bigger. If I make, use a shallower ramp, the force will get weak, smaller still, but I'll have to go all the way out to about here before I get to the height that I had in mind. So the trade-off is perfect. Whether you use, I'll come back to gravitational potential energy in there, I realize in a second. So um, and this is my little graphic text graphic story. I don't know why this guy moved over to the right. But anyway, um, if, if you go up a ladder, you have to exert a big force for a very short distance. If you go up a, a relatively steep ramp, you use less force because your the ramp is helping you support the weight of the object, but you have to travel a longer distance than before. So I've scaled up the, the characters for distance relative to the ladder. And if you go even a shallower ramp, yeah, the force gets smaller still, but the distance gets greater still. The product of these two, force times distance, and this is why I say it's worth knowing this is an equation. This has, this has 
calc this has a quantitative meaning and accuracy. Um, it, as you reduce the force by using a shallower and shallower ramp, you have to compensate by using a longer and longer ramp. You exert the force for, for a greater distance. Questions about that trade-off? You know, it's one of these, I hope you will take this away and remember it forever. Not necessarily about ramps, but all of the simple machines that you probably studied somewhere in, in K through 12. Remember the simple machines? Incline planes, screws, wedges, pulleys, all those things, right? And, and, and they're often taught more as a, not a history of science, but almost a sociology of science story. There are factoids without, without understanding so much. What's the issue? Almost all those simple machines have one simple purpose. They allow you to do the, the same amount of work, the work you want to do, with a different relationship between force and distance. You can use smaller forces over bigger distances, voila, it works. Or you use bigger forces over smaller distances, voila, it works. Uh, levers, for example. Remember, remember levers? A crowbar trying to pry something open? You're using a modest force at the end of the lever over a big distance to exert a huge force over a short distance. You, you're doing the same work. You're opening the, you're, you're pulling the nail out of the, out of the board, something like that, using a smaller force and a longer distance to do the work of pulling the nail out of the, out of the wood. Is that OK? I, mean, I hope it's, it's, a, it's a useful insight into, the, into all these machines. You want to lift a car? You can do it. You're going to have to use a smaller force than the, than the force necessary to lift the whole car up, but you'll use a, a longer distance. So you, you operate a jack that, that you turn along. Lots of movement here, modest force, big distances. All right. And that's the case for ramps. It, they allow you to lift very heavy objects using modest forces exerted over much longer than before distances. Any questions about ramps? All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the question is, it, it's a question about work that if you, if you keep throwing objects, just, just suppose you have a whole bucket, of, you go to the golf course and you, 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 you knock a whole bucket of balls off or you throw them, you're, whatever. Why do you get hot? Because in fact, you're giving away energy each time you do it, right? When I take a ball and actually it's worth, it's worth saying, yeah. when, I, when I throw the ball up, I'm, initially I, I, go, I, I lower it, in it to start with because I, I need some distance to travel before I let go of it. I can't just, poof, I can't just have it go poof off my hand. Why? Because I need distance. I'm doing to do work on it. So I go down a little bit to, to, to give myself some room to move. I then exert a big upward force on it for a distance. Force times distance, I'm doing work on it. And it leaves my hand with energy it didn't have before the throw. So I'm transferring energy to it. Once it leaves my hand, it has energy in the form of motion. Right? My hand, imagine my hand isn't here. It's, it's down here. It's heading up fast, though. It's got energy in its, in its motion, kinetic energy. As it rises, the kinetic energy gradually transforms into gravitational potential energy. And that brings me back. I wanted to go back to this. Ah, there. That, 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 the, the relationship at the bottom is another equation. But it really, what it's telling you is it, it's almost the definition of gravitational potential energy. It's the force that gravity exerts downward on the ball times how high it is. That's, that's the energy that it takes to lift it to that height. So a ball that's way up high has gravitational potential energy it didn't have down low. How much? It's weight times how much higher it was it went. That's force times distance. So when I let, when I let go of the ball, it's traveling upward, but it's low. It's moving fast, but it's, down, it's just here, just above my hand. Most of its energy is in the form of kinetic energy, energy motion. And as it rises, it turns all that kinetic energy into gravitational potential energy, the energy stored in the force of gravity. And it presumably comes motion, becomes motionless for a second. Remember that, that story? At that instant, there's no kinetic energy left. It's all gravitational. And then the reverse happens. As it descends, 
it turns its gravitational potential energy back into kinetic, and it hits me hard. Okay? So the question, however, go, to go back to go back to your question, um, where's my energy going? Why do I get hot? It's because we're we are as 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 organisms, we're we're not very efficient. We're not bad, but we make a lot of of heat that's not necessary. That, 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 that physics doesn't require, but it happens anyway. So in the process of throwing the ball and investing energy in the ball, well, actually, there are two issues here. One is that we're just not that good at turning food energy into mechanical energy. Maybe 50% or 30% of it gets into, the, into, the, into mechanical energy. The rest is just wasted by, by the little molecules and stuff trying to, to work with oxygen to consume the glucose and go through the Krebs cycle, all, all that stuff. So we're, we're just fundamentally inefficient. The other thing is that when you throw the ball, you don't throw the entire object you got moving. Your arm's involved. And that's a total waste. And so at the end of it, ah, you don't want your arm to go with, so you pull it back. The energy goes back into you that you invested in your arm. And so all these are, contribute to, to just turning what started as food energy into, into mechanical energy. OK? Other questions? Yeah, I mean, so, I, there's so many observations that, that I can make about the, the idea that, that people to throw a 100 mile per hour fastball as opposed to a 50 mile an hour fastball. I mean, a good high school pitcher can throw a 50 mile an hour fastball. A world class, amazing pitcher can go to 100. That's only a factor of two. Why is it such a, such a dramatic uh, difference in, 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 in ability required to go from 50 miles an hour to 100. Here, here's the reason. Do you understand the problem? The, the world-class pitcher, there are, there are only a handful of people who can throw 100 miles an hour or faster, or at least back in my day, that was the case. They were, they, you could count them on one hand. Now maybe, it's, now maybe you need your both hands and toes. But it's not everybody. And it's only twice as fast. Why? Why? Here's the reason. It turns out the kinetic energy is not proportional to speed. It, it, it is related to speed. It's, the only thing that matters is speed, in fact, and, oh, and, and the mass of the ball. But it goes as the square of the speed. So if you double the speed of a fastball, which, which is what I'm talking about, it's not, the ball doesn't carry twice the kinetic energy it did, the, it did at 50 mile an hour. It carries four times, four times as much. So far, so good? So already, to throw a 100 mile an hour fastball, you are putting four times as much energy into that ball and consequently also into your hand and other things as you throw it up the whole process. The other thing is, in order to get it up to twice the speed, you basically have to chase it, pushing it forward in half the time. Because it's going to finish, tra when it finishes its trip, it's traveling twice as fast, you only have about half as much time to reach it before it goes out of, out of reach. So they have to invest four times as much energy in pitching it, and they have to do it in about half the time. That means they're investing it eight times as, as, as much energy per second into that ball. It's a factor of eight. And that's why it's so hard to do 100 mile an hour, whereas 50 is within reasonable reach. Is that OK? So sometimes physics gives you insight into things like that. OK. Any other questions about ramps, gravitational potential energy? kinetic energy. All right. I'm going to leave ramps. Go on to seesaws. <clears throat> seesaws, this is a topic. I have a love-hate relationship with this topic. I've tried changing it to other things like windmills and stuff. But I keep coming back to seesaws because it's such a, it just has what I want to talk about in it perfectly. Uh, they've become remarkably rare. There are no conventional seesaws anywhere near this Charlottesville. Uh, well, we have one in the attic that I built, but that's like it. They're gone. It's really disappointing. They were everywhere when I was a kid. Um, I think they're gone in part because the only seesaws most kids want to play on are apps. And and then the other thing is that, that they're, they're dangerous. 
seesaws, the, the classic seesaw problem. I mean, do you guys know seesaws anymore? Other than like nursery rhymes or something? The, the classic seesaw problem is the two kids on a pretty much balanced seesaw, which is, which is the story, I really. So here are the two kids, and they're happily playing seesaw back and forth and back and forth. And then this kid loses interest and jumps off the seesaw. And that kid goes and gets a lawyer. So, um, but otherwise, they're great illustrations of physics. It's, it's actually very simple physics. And it, it's my way of introducing the physics of, rot of rotary motion. And we, we've done trans what are, what's called translational motion now, uh, up until this point. You're going somewhere, which I, why does it have the name translational? I don't know. It has nothing to do with languages and whatever. But, but, but this is translational motion. I'm moving from one place to another. Rotational motion is different. Um, I, I, this is rotational motion. I'm not going anywhere in, in, in many uh, respects. But it's still an interesting motion. It, it's less important for, for the context of this class by far than translational motion. So I'm, 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 I'm always conflicted over how much attention to give it, but I do it. I'll try to balance it decently. And so I'll start off with, with a, uh, one of my questions. And the, and the question, we'll see whether we can answer it up front. It's actually a very sophisticated question to answer, uh, to know the answer, but you can sort of take a shot at it anyway. You and a child half your height. So, there, so there, there's you, and there's, the, there's this short kid here. And the two of you simultaneously, maybe with the help of something else, uh, lean out over a swimming pool. So this is to avoid the lawyers, too. I don't want the kid injured. I mean, you I don't care about. But so OK, so you both lean over. You lean over the pool. The kid's leaning, too. And the two of you then simultaneously let go and, and tip over, pivot about your feet into the pool. Can you, can you picture the story? The question is, who hits the water first? Or is it the same at the same time? You OK with the question? How many think that you hit the water first? How many think the kid hits the water first? Okay, the majority is going for the kid. And, 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 and so I'll show you. All right, so here's, in honor of this, we've got a new, this is a two meter, this is a meter stick, metric, right? And this is a two meter stick. And the, other, the old meter stick, two meter stick, was broken somewhere last semester, much to my dismay. And it's, we're back, we have, we have complete meter sticks. OK, so here's you, right? Here's the kid. You both lean out to the same, try not to break the meter stick. You both lean out to the same angle and simultaneously pivot about your feet. Let go and pivot. Ready? Get set. Who hit first? The kid. The kid hits first. All right? And it's not even close. If you missed it, I'll show you again just so you know that it's real. It is quite real. Short stuff tips over easily and quickly, I would say. Tall stuff, much, much, much harder. Uh, this is familiar if you ever cut down trees, which is something to pay attention to. If you cut down a tree and then you know the timber, you know, why does it take so long for the tree to go over? Because it's a really tall kid. If it goes over, it, yeah, all right. I guess wait, wait, somewhere in Tolkien books we can have it with a face and everything. Um, and then I would be in terrible trouble and probably dropped in the mortar somewhere. So the really tall stuff has tremendous difficulty undergoing what's known as angular acceleration. The, the whole process of going faster and faster is very difficult for a tall, long object. It has an enormous resistance to that angular acceleration. And that resistance has a name. And the name I use for it is, is rotational mass. It's, it's as though it's become very resistant to rotary shaking. And what I, what I would encourage you to do at the end of class, if you have a chance, come up here and try to you know, grab the end of the stick and see what it's like to, to rotationally shake this, to go first rotating one way and then back. This is easy. This one, which has only twice as much wood, is much harder. 
to swing back and forth. This resists all the rotational changes, much more than this guy. And that's the dominant effect in this story. That the little guy, the short guy, can, can go from motionless to rotating fast quite easily. Whereas the long guy, much harder for it to, to undergo that rotational change to, to, to rotate over. Uh, as, as public service announcement, for those of you who have and or will cut down trees, be really careful with them because I mean, obviously you don't want to be under it when, when the whole thing rotates over, but, but there are other subtle effects that can occur to you, and that is that long objects, given the opportunity, and this, given how hard it is for them to, to undergo this rotational change, they tend to snap uh, in, into multiple pieces. They don't go over as one if they can help it. So if it's a nice sturdy tree, a fresh, green tree that was growing and you, ki and you, you killed it, it may well go over as a whole. But if it's a dead, rotten tree, ooh, be careful. Because a lot of times they will snap en route part and become one short guy that rotates it quickly and one suspended object that no longer rotates at all but simply falls, falling object. And people get creamed by the falling object. So, no, I mean, it, 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 I, I, two notes for this. One is, is it's, it's, a, it's not, you know, it's funny, it's not a very funny thing because, two, two notes is, I occasionally step on people's uh, personal issues with my quips and whatever, and I apologize in advance if I do that. I, it, it, it's quite real that I've done this. Uh, and I've told you, those of you in 10th, if you know, the, you know, one of my stories was, was, a, was a airplanes, airplane wings can undergo a, a phenomenon known as stalling, where they lose their, the, the airflow over them uh, loses its normal behavior and they, in, instead of flying properly, they become uh, air resistance and, they, and the planes uh, plummet as a result. And, and, and to my, sadly enough, one of the students in the class a couple years ago had lost her father. I wasn't aware of this, lost her father to a stalled wing uh, accident. It's particularly common in, during takeoffs and landings particularly of little, little uh, putt-putts, little uh, you know, four-seaters four and stuff. Um, you do not want to stall the, way, stall the airflow. It involves, it's a, it's a, it's a story. I won't, it's, if you want to know the stories of how, how, to, how to avoid stalling, it's something you avoid. When you're, when, you're, when you're a pilot, you learn to avoid stalling. And there are warnings for this and all. Anyhow, I, I uh, under, inadvertently uh, really upset her. So if I do that to somebody, you know, t talk to me about it. I, I really don't mean to do that. And so here with the falling... The falling trees, back to, back to the relevant one. The falling trees one, that we, we had a, a family friend here. In fact, he, was a, he retired but from, from UVA. He was, he was uh, put in a wheelchair for the last 20 years by a, exactly this phenomenon, a tree snapping during the falling process and hitting it, landing on him. Um, don't, you know, be aware if you're, particularly if you're working with a tree that's in bad shape, uh, when you cut it, it can snap as it falls for good physics reasons. Okay? All right, so on to the real story at hand. And as with seesaws, is that when a seesaw is balanced, it rocks back and forth relatively easily. So, so you, you put, I, I, in the simplest form, you put two, two children of equal weight at opposite ends of the seesaw, and that balances the seesaw, which is something we've got to pin down what the heck is balanced. And then it can rock back and forth. The rocking motion is kind of interesting. It involves not going anywhere, but rather pivoting about a point. It's a rotary motion. And it's a complicated rotary motion because it, it, it involves rotating first counterclockwise from your perspective, and then clockwise, and then counterclockwise. There's a lot going on there. And um, if you all had, had or have had uh, experience with riding seesaws, it's rare that you have two kids that are truly of the same weight. And so they got to make adjustments. So, for example, um, two kids. If the, if the, you know, here's the. Hey, come, will you play seesaw with you? Play? Will you play with you? And finally, you know, the only person left is dad. You know, seesaw like this is kind of boring. Dad, aren't you going to do anything? Right? But if dad moves in close to the pivot. And 
Now, now they can play seesaw. Woo. Oh, look, a butterfly. <laughs> ah, my back. No, okay. All right, so you can balance a seesaw with two different people having quite different weights, but they have to sit at different distances from the pivot. So try to figure out the physics of that is, is part of the story. All right. So let me see where I can go after some of this stuff today. Um, I will not. I will try to keep this short. You can get lost in this stupid stuff. Th you know, this is one of these topics when I, I can drag it on forever. I don't mean to do that. So, how does a balanced seesaw move? Is where we're going to start. And the main a main point to bring up with this is that that everything I've talked about with respect to translational motion, the mo the, the motion of going somewhere, it has its analogy in rotation. So just as there is something known as position, it tells where you are translationally, there is something called, known as uh, angular position that tells how, you're orient how you are oriented rotationally. They go, they're, they're, they're very, very uh, uh, related. So the, here, here's, the, here's the, uh, the, the observation. This is... Uh, a, a variation on a seesaw. It's a variation, I've taken it off the ground and put the pivot through the center just so that it can move freely without hitting the, no parts of it hitting the ground. And I've tried as best I can to balance it by putting little weights on it because it's not perfect. Uh, but it's motion when you leave it alone, that is make it free of forces, uh, the, free of influences that affect rotational motion, which is not forces, we'll come to that in a second. Its motion is that of inertia. It has rotational inertia. Once you get it going, it keeps doing what it was doing. It rotates steadily around a fixed axis, which I'll, which I'll, which I'll do in more detail shortly. Let me stop it. But in order to describe this decently, I want to create, I want to bring the, the physical quantities th that I need into, into our language. The first is that the the rotational analog to position is just angular position. The rotational analog to velocity is angular velocity. And the rotational al analog to force, that is the influences that affect translational motion, is torque. Torque is the tor torques or twists are the rotational, uh, the influence that affects rotational motion. And so there's going to be a perfect relationship between, well, a good, yeah, good relationship between them. So what's angular position? So I, I've told you already that, that, that translational position, or just position, requires, it requires sort of three items of information. One is a reference, which way back when, if you remember, my reference position was, this is position zero. And I needed an amount, which is a distance in, in the case of position, and a direction. So how far from the position zero and what direction from position zero? That was for position. For angular position, the story is a little different. You need a reference. And the reference is not a where in space. It's a how, how you're oriented in space. This is position zero facing you. And any other possibility like this or this or this, those are all shifted away from position zero by both an amount, which is how far you've rotated, and a direction, which is, which is the axis about which you've rotated, the pivot, the rotisserie, if you will. So for example, if this is officially position zero, uh, anger position zero, then this would be 90 degrees from position zero. You okay so far? That's the amount. The direction's a little tricky. What, what's, what's the direction? Because this is 90 degrees, and this is also 90 degrees, and this is 90 degrees. They're all 90 degrees from position zero, but about different axes. Uh, different, yeah. And so it being 150, I will save the position, angular position, the rest of the story for Wednesday.